Um, so to our first presenter, um, I'd like to introduce David Mason. Now David has had an extensive career in agriculture spanning at least 50 years, including time as a jackaroo and overseer of two commercial farms. He has also been a junior farmer supervisor, a manager of the Orange and Trangy Research Centres, manager of the Yanko Agricultural Institute and the Cronulla Fisheries Research Institute. He's also been a manager of a bilateral land development and settlement project in Sri Lanka. David has a lot of experience. Uh, he's also a manager of a number of, been a manager of a number of New South Wales government horticultural, agronomic, natural resource and drought support programs. <coughs> I suspect he knows a fair bit about systems. Uh, and in the 20 years prior to his retirement in 2012, his focus was to have agriculture recognised as a worthy and legitimate land use in the Sydney region. Isn't that a mind-boggling concept that agriculture would not be uh, a legitimate purpose? Anyway, in that context, he facilitated a five-year consultation process that resulted in the release of the Strategic Plan for Sustainable Agriculture, Sydney region, by the New South Wales Minister for Agriculture in 1998. This was the first strategic interve intervention by government into Sydney agriculture since Governor Lachlan Macquarie proclaimed the five Macquarie town in 1810. There's a lot of government leadership in this area. <laughs> in 2000, David co-facilitated the development of Hawkesbury Harvest and was its foundation chair for the first four years. In 2006, he was awarded a Churchill Fellowship to undertake a study tour of urban agriculture in Singapore the UK, the Netherlands, USA and Canada. Please welcome David Mason to talk about the Hawkesbury Harvest Journey. Thank you, Rob. Great. Right. Oh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. And um, I'd just like to start by saying how delighted I am be invited here by Peter Kenyon. Uh, I've known Peter for many years and he was, he was very interested in Hawkesbury Harvest when it first started when he was living in Sydney. Uh, and Hawkesbury Harvest of course now is known as Harvest Trails and Markets. May last year my wife and I would travel down from Sydney. We stopped overnight here in Wangaratta uh, on a little farm outside of town in a little cabin. And we came into town, we are on our way back to, to Victoria, we we're, were going down to Victoria, but we were going down to the, the Great Ocean Road and then up, uh, up to the Grampians and across through Ballarat and Bendigo. Most wonderful trip, we thoroughly enjoyed it. And um, anyway, we came into town for a meal, went to Ronaldo's, and I was talking to the young fellow there uh, that was serving us and asking him some questions and he was saying he grew his own food and his, he and his wife were networking and so forth and there was a little bit of this going on around the district and I said to my wife you know I think Wangaratta might be ready for a Hawkesbury Harvest type experience and of course not long after that Peter contacted me and uh, here I am so <laughs> it's amazing uh, how incident has happened. Um, so I'm going, to, I'm going to set a bit of a context for the presentation I'm giving tonight. Uh, at the end of 1992 I was sent to Sydney from Orange uh, in the Central West to deal with the issue of agriculture in the Sydney Basin because it was under enormous pressure. And at the, the Sydney region extended from Picton in the south to Lithgow in the west to Wyoming in the north. And the value of agriculture at that time was a billion dollars at the farm gate. What that represented was it was 12% of the state's total agricultural production produced on less than 1% of the state's total agricultural land and employed about 11% of the state's total employment in agriculture. I mean, it was extraordinary. It was, I mean, most people thought agriculture belonged over the range and, and that's where their food came from or from somewhere else. But a lot of it actually came from Sydney, the, the fresh vegetables, the, the mushrooms, the, the, um, the, the, the eggs and, the, and, and so forth, even you know, quite a bit of dairy. Um, so I had, I had to think of some way in which to um, deal with this issue. And so I started a process within the Department of, Prime, uh, Department of Agriculture, which is now the Department of Primary Industries, which is now something else. I've been mean, retired and renamed it again, but I, don't, I think they just try to confuse people all the time. 
Um, and so I started this process in a department called Sustainable Agriculture for the Environment, SAFE. And out of that process came the, the idea that we actually do a strategic plan for sustainable agriculture in the Sydney, in the Sydney region. And it took five years of consultations through all the different groups. There were probably 40 or 50 different uh, major stakeholders, including industry and local government and, and consumers as well, the whole, the whole, whole gambit. And this, uh, as Rob said, was released by the Minister for Agriculture in 1998. Uh, it was, it's, it's, it's not prescriptive, but it provides a framework in terms of uh, the five, six basic things, planning, the benefit of sustainable agriculture, information, incentives and equity, education and promotion, agricultural resource management. And it's one of the things that was in it as part of a strategy or policy action was um, provide the continuation of farm gate sales and develop the implementation, uh, develop and implement, implement marketing strategies and identify funding opportunities for value adding. So that, that was, that, those things were in there and of course that sort of fitted in very nicely to Hawkesby Harvest when it started. However, this provided, uh, this provided information for policy makers and strategists within government mainly and within industry. And I realised that if we were actually going to try and have some hope of, of uh, saving some agriculture in the Sydney Basin, we actually had to connect at a political level and that was at the grassroots. And what I was aiming then to do was to actually link the, the growers with the, with, the, with the actual consumer, the Sydney consumer. And it was quite an effort for all that decade, the night, well, the, the remainder of that decade from 1993 through to 2000, uh, I, I went to just about every meeting I could to sort of get, try and find some way that I could get this link between the consumer and the, and the local grower. And then, in 2000, it happened. Uh, and it was quite amazing. It has been written and spoken about as the Hawkesbury Harvest phenomenon. And I'm going to now tell you the story about Hawkesbury Harvest. Now, a long time ago, in a faraway place called Sydney, there were two sectors which hadn't really connected. And um, it was, they were both frustrated. I don't have time, so. <coughs> and these two key sectors were facing problems. One was farming and one was community health. The farming was pressured from urban development and market structures, and the community health was pressured from the food system, the fast food system in particular, and the impacts of the, uh, on community health that that was having. They were also feeling the strain, farming in terms of financial distress and generational crisis, and community health suffering from supply, security, safety, quality and access, and sustainability. Now the, generous, the genesis of an innovative response, now that's the Hawkesbury region, and the, this is the Hawkesbury where when Macquarie created those five towns was in this area out here, and this was the food bowl of Sydney. Up to the point when this became productive in the early 1800s, Sydney was starving, and it was in this, <coughs> in this area that the, food, uh, the majority, this was the food bowl of Sydney. This is Sydney down here, this is Broken Bay and the, and the Hawkesbury River which goes into the Fen River, uh, it follows that line. <coughs> um, let's get used to this. New South Wales agriculture through the strategic uh, plan for sustainable agriculture uh, was about food supply, food quality and sustainability. Now some of you will remember in 1992 there was a the World, the World Health Organization had a conference in Rio de Janeiro. Uh, it was about development and the environment. And out of that came the Healthy Cities program, the Agenda 21. Now, Hawkesbury City Council at the time had a mayor and a CEO uh, and a general manager who actually saw the, 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 the link between agriculture and, 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 and health, local agriculture and, and health. And so what they did, they created the Hawkesbury Food Program. And I'll just read you what the Hawkesbury Food Program 
it's really about. This is a breakthrough. When, when, when bureaucrats and politicians start to think in this, these terms, that's pretty good stuff. The Hawks Free Food Program aims to develop a multi-strategy approach to food and nutrition issues in the Hawks Free Local Government area. It aims to improve the health and the well-being of the community by strengthening links between the community and local food production, improving access to and consumption of safe, nutritious, affordable food. It involved the Hawkesbury District Health Service, the Wentworth Area Health Service, Hawkesbury City Council, University of Western Sydney, Hawkesbury, New South Wales Agriculture, and that was my link with the, with the committee, Hawkesbury Schools, Earth Care, Food for All, and local community agencies. So there, there was eventually a, a link between agriculture and food and, and public health. It was fantastic. It was a breakthrough. <coughs> now, I was a member of a subcommittee of, of the Hawkesbury Food Program. <coughs> we were trying to work out what's called Hawkesbury Cuisine. We were trying to think if we, we get these, you know, we have these recipes and we, get, we put it out into the community, people might start to buy the local food to make, you know, uh, food for their family and their children and whatever else. But it wasn't working. So I was part of a, a committee, of, I was on a committee with the Western Sydney Industry Awards. Uh, and there was a woman there, she was a, a New Zealander, she'd been brought up on a dairy farm, she had the broadest New Zealand accent I've ever heard in my life, uh, and despite the fact that I could hardly understand her, I asked her to come and speak to the cuisine group, and she was a tremendous marketing person, and she, one of the things she said to us, you know, agriculture will not stand up on its own, it, it needs to link with something else, something like tourism. Well, as soon as she said that, I can tell you now, it was like someone had thrown a, a, a match into a can of petrol. I, the, 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 the energy that generated out of those few words from her in that room was unbelievable. I've never experienced anything like it in my life. And, um, <coughs> and it still sends shivers up my back sometimes. Someone said Five Gate Trail, someone said Horsby Harvest, and, and that was in March 2000, and from then you couldn't stop it. They had asked me to facilitate it, and I can tell you now, trying to deal with the energy and the ideas that was coming out of everybody who wanted to be involved in this was like trying to put an octopus in a matchbox. <laughs> it was unbelievable. It was fantastic, great experience. So this poultry food program was about food security, food access and food safety. And where it all happened, we had a public meeting. I, and I, um, you know, this is the Hawkesbury River uh, and that's the Richmond Lowlands there <coughs> where the where Macquarie farmers were producing food. And there was an orchardist there, an uh, orange orchardist, and uh, he, he said he'd have a meeting at his uh, packing shed on the uh, orange orchard. And we got about 40, about the same size as this. And, and I, I, met, I chaired that meeting and I remember looking out and I could see, I could see in the people's eyes, they just, this was like, this was like, this thing had arrived. It was its time had come. And, um, and the farm gate trail was born in that, that was the May of 2000. And, um, and it just went on from there. I facilitated that process uh, that year and then continued as, as the chair of the, the, uh, of the Hawkesbury Harvest and uh, until I just, I burned out after five years. I tell you, the enthusiasm, being involved in it was just fantastic, but it does burn you out. Uh, but then someone took over and I recovered and got back into it. <laughs> the mission statement for Hawkesbury Harvest is a community-based association committed to improving the economic viability and sustainability of local agriculture, involving Farmgate Trail, the Growers Directory and the Business Development. The harvest development had a number of stages. Stage one was an agri-tourism initiative, a farm gate trail, and that was exploring the potential of tourism as a support mechanism for sustainable agriculture. The second stage was <clears throat> farm gate trail and regional branding, growers market, uh, local retailing, providoring, specialty agriculture, open farms. Some of these were highly successful, the farmers markets for instance, the open farms, uh, we have some successful regional branding, um, local retailing, a bit, bit difficult, uh, but 
doesn't mean to say it won't happen. Things are happening still. Specialty agriculture, we've had some couple of really good things happen there and I'll, that'll come up as we go through. And that was about harnessing momentum for diversification and business development opportunities. Now this was one of the original, this was the first map that came out in October uh, at the end of 2000. Uh, it was, it's got 13 destinations, they're all pretty raw because uh, these were farmers, they were, and, and uh, value adders and they hadn't really, you know, uh, had much to do with the public before so they just took off, they were a little bit um, um, unsophisticated I might say, but that's alright, they, they learnt and they've, they've become very successful in many ways. Um, it was, that was printed on an A4, um, it was, um, it was run off on uh, someone's private uh, computer and, and, and printer and that was our first map at the end of um, uh, Tizana Winery was one of the original members, it's Peter Ald. Uh, he says, Hawkesbury Harvest Office Tizana, a food focused cooperative marketing program and delivers to the cellar door a new range of clients not otherwise targeted by our own advertising. The trail concept is a useful one as weekend drivers have a purpose and like to visit more than one business, creating a more fulfilling experience. Uh, he and his son, Jonathan, uh, they've got the uh, cellar tastings and then they've also got the B&B, so they, they've branched out in different ways. They grow their own grapes and, uh, and they've maintained that. It's a beautiful, it's a beautiful vineyard, very historic. Uh, John, John, uh, John uh, Maguire at Dennis Killen Orchard at Grosvenor. I live next to John, those trees up on the hill there at the left, they were on our property uh, and uh, he was our neighbour, a lovely man. Uh, John, he said, Hawkesbury Harvest provides me with a net network of farmers who buy and sell from each other according to seasonal demands. Hawkesbury Harvest networking and promote, promotion has assisted in the rapid growth of my expanding tourist business, with Hawkesbury Harvest being an integral part of that growth. Now this fellow here in terms of specialty products, Carradell Native Foods, he was the original, before he came on the hook, before Hawkesbury Harvest started, he actually ran an eco-tourism uh, business up in the hills behind the, the, the um, Carajong and he'd take people down into the valleys and whatever on his place and there was a, a fruit tree, and, a native fruit tree in bloom, uh, with fruit sorry, and someone said what is it? he told them, they said why don't you make some fruit, and so he said oh, that's a good idea uh, and um, he started Carajong Native Food, so when Hawkesby Harvest started he came on the committee, uh, he just started the Carajong Native Foods uh, he says, Carajong Native Foods started about the same time as Hawkesbury Harvest. Since then, my business has experienced exponential growth, <coughs> growth due to, in part to the role that Hawkesbury Harvest has played in promoting, supporting, and producing and, and support a product, and also through the combined efforts of Harvest members who stock and sell any foods, my foods, in their establishments. The various marketing, branding, sales, and business opportunities that have come from Haw Harvest have been far beyond what I thought possible in those early days. and and with the new business development funding approved, I firmly believe that we are only warming up. Now that, that boy, that, man, that young man, he was only about 25 at the time, he has developed an international business and Hawkesbury Harvest has been part of that process. That particular, it's a, nat it's a native um, hibiscus and it would be, that would be in every international airport in the world and any specialty shop in the world. He exports that uh, from Carajong, from the from the Hawkesbury, all over the world, and he has gone from, <coughs> you know, from a student who, who wanted to do this, became a member of Hawkesbury Harvest, and he's he's been an outstanding success. The value adding in terms of um, Lavosh, I don't know if you've heard of the Carajong Kitchens, but they're they're Lavosh, they 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 were the initial members, um, and they were branding, they were actually putting the Hawkesbury Harvest brand on their on their packaging. Uh, and Cole said, if you keep doing that, you won't, you won't, you know, we, we won't let you use it. It's through us, so that I've had to remove it, um, such is the way Coles operates. But uh, pick your own, that's another fantastic uh, thing that's been so successful. People come out from Sydney uh, and pick their apples and their oranges and their chestnut and walnut. Bill Shields, who Jane Sims and I worked in rural youth together and Bill Shields was the president of rural youth, senior rural youth. Bill's a, an apple producer up in, um, in, in uh, Bilpin and 
he sells all his product now through the farm gate. He was telling me, that, sorry, I met him on last Friday because I wanted to just acquaint myself, reacquaint myself with what was happening on the trial before I came down here. He said in April of this year, he had 14,000 hits on his Google business. You know, that you go on Google and you click on it and it comes the details about a particular place and tells you the directions and how you contact them. 14,000 hits in April uh, for people who want to come out and pick on his place. We, in, in, the, in the chestnut and walnut season up uh, March, April, up in the Mount Wilson area of the Blue Mountains, they can have thousands, two farms up there, they can have thousands on their farms over a weekend picking the chestnuts and walnuts. They don't have, they don't have, they just all, all the owners do is take the money. Everyone else does the hard work. It's fantastic. <laughs> Um, so the evolutionary model of poultry harvest is that stage one was the agritourism initiative, stage two was the business development, and then of course as poultry harvest started to develop its um, capacity and, and influence, it started to become involved as, a, as a, an advocacy role on behalf of agriculture and the growers and so forth. So it, and there's that advocacy role, broader land use issues, political advocacy, harnessing strategic relationships, dealing with all those stakeholders down, the, down, the, down here, and representing agriculture into strict policy making, policy actions and strategic. So it was starting to build some momentum. And this is, this is essentially what it's all about. It's a, this is what horseshoe is about. The horseshoe region is valued locally, regionally, and nationally and internationally for these things. Produce, products, heritage, place to live, sense of community. Produced in the region, lo local value added, links to the local towns and regional culture, relationships with artisans and so forth. Supporting the host region, connecting with them, bringing together, together sustainability. That's what, that's, that's what it's all about. And, and any region that's successful is, is doing that. Um, <clears throat> now this is, from a regional development point of view, this is something I put together in the initial parts of the book, State of the Portrait Harvest, and I believe there's a lot of potential in this, regional agriculture and agribusiness development. You have to have the, oh, sorry, you have to have the community engagement through the farm gate trail, the farmers markets, open farm days and so forth. But the business industry development can be any or all of these things here. And then in the middle, you have your standards in food safety and biosecurity, research and extension, education and training, the different forms of marketing and the, and the different ways you can raise money for the organisation. I'm, I'm happy to leave this presentation here for people to access and think about it, Peter, so very happy to do that. Um, <coughs> regional branding, there's Peppy's Ducks. This, uh, it's, uh, Peppy's Ducks is located, this head office is located in Windsor in the, in the Hawkesbury. Quite a few years ago, Peppy, Peppy's an Italian, little Italian guy. He, he had two ducks. Now he's got millions of them. <laughs> <laughs> Never turn your back on a duck. <laughs> and he, his main duck uh, was the was the, uh, the the Peking duck, which had a the Asian population in Sydney, and of course they like a high fat to uh, meat ratio, whereas the Anglo-Saxon taste likes to prefers a lot of more meat to the fat ratio. And so he, Peppy, started um, importing these Grimaud ducks from France and Belgium and built up. A, um, a built up his, his flock, and then and, and then he started to market them, and and they they wanted to use a Hawkesbury Harvest brand. And Woolworths said, "We'll buy your product, but you can't have the brand." They told Woolworths they're going to jump in the lake, so they they didn't need Woolworths. They, they were happy to they wanted to have the brand. So you know, it's up to the it's up to the various in the various circumstances of growers and such in terms of the branding. Now <coughs> the. This is, the, this is the map here, 11, the last of the hard copy maps. So over, over time, we, we issued different maps um, for people to, and they were all hard copy. Uh, and um, by the time we got to this point, back in, in 2011, 
horsery harvests that had actually started, which started in a horsery uh, there, it was horsery harvest, horsery, was horse, and then there was the Sydney Hills to Brooklyn area, so that, that was also horsery harvest in the Penrith Valley, horsery harvest, Wallandilly horsery harvest, and the South Coast horsery harvest. And of course, what they were saying to us, look, we're, we're not part of the horsery, we'd like to have our own identity and not just be seen as horsery harvest. So that's when things changed to the uh, harvest um, uh, <coughs> harvest trails and markets. And so each 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 each, each um, subregion was able to call themselves uh, horsery harvest, Sydney Hills and Brooklyn harvest, uh, Penrith Valley harvest, and so forth. So they had their own identity as such, and that's worked really well. In 2013, we went to the Farmgate app. It costs about $25,000 to to get up. Uh, you can, if you, it's called the Farmgate. You can download it onto your iPhone and have a look at it. But uh, that's been quite successful. Um, not too sure it's a $25,000 investment. But the thing is, today, of course, you've got to be in this. You've got to be in this uh, in this type of thing, uh, social media, and um, most of the. Um, this is taken off the, uh, or, uh, sorry, the um, Harvest Trails and Mark, Marcus website, and 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 you can see this this differentiation between the various, uh, you know, this is the South Coast Harvest, this is uh, Warrandilly Harvest, this is Penrith Harvest, this is uh, Hawkesbury Harvest, this is uh, the Hills Hills Harvest, and that's a new one just come on board is the Central Coast Harvest. And you can go online. You can download. If you want to come on the on the heart, on the trail to any one of those places or regions, you just go online and you you download <coughs> and from there. And that's working really well. They get a thousand hits a day on that website. Unique <coughs> hits, not people going in and going through a whole heap of pages. That's a thousand people go online a day to to look, to look at the site. So it's really, it's, we've built it up over, it's been a fantastic response. Now, how am I going? Uh, five minutes. Five minutes, okay, I'll finish. Um, <clears throat> because Hawkesbury Harvest was so successful, um, uh, <coughs> I got involved in helping a group of people in the southern New South Wales to develop something similar. They came and as I was still employed by the department, and um, and they said we want your help, and so I was very happy to help them. And they they have developed this organisation now called Southern Harvest, and its main um, criteria is growing local and regional food communities. Now the website is the southernharvest.org.au, and it's worth having a look at because it's not just about food; it's about farmers markets, it's about workshops, it's about it, it's about events, a whole range of stuff, and they have they have really hit their straps. And the area that they cover is that. I mean, north of that is Sydney, and 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 this southern harvest now links into the bottom of Hawkesbury Harvest and comes right down, right down here almost. And I can't see why you can't have a whatever you want to call it a harvest and we can keep going further south. I mean, it's, and that's the whole thing about that's the whole thing about all this thing. It's about it's about continuity and 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 and, and the word harvest is so powerful. The Chinese come in, they first thing they do is they put in harvest, and all this stuff comes up. Um, now, the ingredients of success is relationships. It's about relationships. Sustainability is based on relationships and trust and leverage, leverage, one industry leveraging off the other, one region levering off the other, one individual levering, or individuals levering off each other. It's not about being an insular little uh, business and saying, I don't want to, I want to beat the competition, I'm not going to let anyone be associated with my business. That's nonsense. That, that doesn't work. It's setting yourself up for failure. Uh, it requires local organisations to host. The Central Coast, been hosted by the Central Coast Regional uh, Chamber of Commerce, and it's really starting to work very well. 
the chain, uh, you need champions in each sector. Uh, you need a political ch uh, champion. I think you probably have one in your local member here. Um, uh, I hope uh, you certainly need so someone at the grower level who's a champion. You need somebody at local government level, and you certainly need somebody in the media. Because when, my, when we started Hawkesbury Harvest, my wife was a senior journalist at the uh, Hawkesbury um, Gazette, uh, Fairfax, and she she wrote enormously about uh, Hawkesbury Harvest, and it, it was it was fantastic. And then, of course, we were able to get out onto uh, the Saturday morning ABC 702 Regional Sydney uh, Radio with Simon Marty, and we always we had a, we had a segment on that show uh, for the last 15 years or more, and it reaches an audience of about 100,000 people every Saturday morning. So the more publicity, the more media exposure you can get, the better. And the other thing you need is passion. It won't work without passion. Uh, and committees, and, uh, and, I, and uh, when I chair the, the, media, the meetings, I'd say any committee member, you just leave your ego at the door. You're not interested in egos. This is about the public good. This is about the good of all members. You want to big note yourself, stay out. And that work that that really works. Now the other thing is that's really important is agriculture is the main driver, and, and with and uh, driver and focus with other disciplines as a co-driver. People say, "Oh, we're going to set up this tourism thing." That's fine. Tourism is really important, but in terms of setting this type of operation up, it is the agriculture, the land use that, that's associated with that, the community that's associated with that and all the networks that are associated, that is really important. Because in, my la in the later stages of my career, I became very much aware of this type of agriculture, what they call multifunctional agriculture, mainly in Europe. And I went to a conference in Holland, and agritourism is, tourism is, is only one component of, of many that you can actually use with your agriculture. You, you got, I, went, I went onto a farm in, in, in Holland where they bred horses and they sold horses and they had horse uh, schools and all sorts of things. And they also had injury rehabilitation. People who had been hurt in accidents would come to that farm and they would have a program designed about working on that farm as part of their recovery. They also had a bakery. They used to make bread and, and sell it into the local towns around about. So it was a multifaceted, multifunctional multi type of agriculture going on. It was phenomenal. There's, you know, there's things like organics and carbon offsets, and bird watching, fishing. I mean, I reckon there's, you know, people in Sydney are so bored with their life up there. And <laughs> if you, someone said that it was a, a, you know, a, farmer or a dairy farmer, or you can you can have weekend um, and, and Melbourne as well. You can have um, you can have weekend workshops and get people to come and stay you know, over, over the weekend and you can show them how to make bread and how to make cheese and yogurt. You know, all these things are possible. Uh, art schools, eco-tourism, direct marketing, internet marketing. You know, the potential is enormous. That's it. Thank you, David. Um, that was uh, a fascinating presentation and uh, much passion demonstrated. Uh, thank you. Um, we've got time for just a couple of questions. Any questions for David before we move on? Di? I just wondered why didn't Coles like the branding on the... They don't like... I don't, I don't know. Okay. I don't understand. I don't understand the... They just don't want any competition. Well, they, 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 they want their own branding, of course. Yeah. That's all they want. They, they want to, they're, they're eliminating so many brands and they're just putting their own brand out there. That's what that's about. It's yes. also a threat as well to being able to source it from elsewhere. Mm. So at some point, if you find a cheaper thing and you've already got it locked into all three harvests, you can't replace it something from China or an import from New Zealand or some, you know, some other place. Yes. But the, the important pieces of knowledge about the system that gets created here that you need to be cognizant that you can come up with barriers sometime in the future because of decisions you make. 
So it's a it's a salient lesson about um, cutting yourself out of something or developing conflicts, perverse outcomes. Yeah. So anyway, that's a, it's an interesting thing to avoid such thing. Uh, another question? I've got one question. Is about what's the um, the governance of it? What's does it? Who who who? What is Hawkesbury Harvest? Yeah, the yeah, it's kernel. a not for profit organisation. Yeah. It, that's an incorporated that, association. Incorporated, right? And but it's in a stage now where um, Ian Nowd, who was the co, I presented. He and I worked on this presentation for years in Hawkesbury Harvest. He's a committee member. He was a senior lecturer at the University of Western Sydney in tourism, and he did his thesis, uh, his PhD on Hawkesbury Harvest, and he got that last year or the year before. Anyway, he was given a redundancy, and he took that. And now he is CEO of Hawkesbury Harvest, um, and he, he is working Hawkesbury Harvest to become a stand. I think hopefully a standalone business as such, uh, so that it can generate income through you know economic activities that are a real benefit to the to the, to the producer and, and the value adders and all those members, but also value to the to the consumer as well. Yeah. So that's a process that's mm. happening right now. Yes. Thank you. Is there project funding from Yes, we, we, we got quite a bit of support um, uh, and from local government and from the uh, well state government, they paid my salary, um, so that was significant. And the, but the federal government, we got regional uh, funding. Uh, and, and yet Sydney wasn't really thought of as a region as such. I remember having to go and talk to um, uh, Tucky Ironbar, Tucky, what's his first name? Uh, uh, Wilson Tucky. Yeah, Wilson Tucky. Uh, in a meeting uh, put together by uh, Alan Cadman, who was the member for the Hills. And, had, and Alan and I really got on well together. And he, he said, I'll, I'll organise a, a meeting with uh, Wilson Tucky. And as soon as I walked in, Wilson Tucky said, You don't qualify for, for regional funding. Anyway, I told him the story. Anyway, we got what we wanted. The best. <laughs> <laughs> um, we, we, I'll, I'll go one more question, but we really do have to um, move on. So, with the uh, the, uh, the brand, uh, is that owned by the the uh, Hawkesbury Harvest? Is that owned by uh, the peak body, if you like? And are there criteria to that you have to satisfy to be able to use it? And is there a fee associated with? Uh, Having access to it. Well, you can access it by virtue of being a member, and, and the members pay. I mean, initially we started off we were charging about $100. Today, um, a fully fledged member who's on the web, on the on the um, app, and um, and uh, yeah, they pay about $600 a year. Uh, but that's been a that's been something we've worked people into. We haven't sort of said we're going to hit you with it. That sort of money is right up front because they're just getting established, but now they can afford it, and so they they have access to the the, the branding. They, each farm gate outlet gets a decal with the Hawkesbury or the, the Harvest logo on it, which they put on their fence posts or whatever. Um, and um, yeah, so that's 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 how that operates. Yeah. Thank you. Um, thank you, David.